All right, so the title of my sermon this morning is Principles on Friendship. Principles on Friendship. So I just wanted to talk about, um, you know, how to be a good friend and how to be a bad friend. And uh, look at some examples in the Bible. I thought it'd be uh, interesting because, um, you know, I think you want to, as best as possible, um, you know, build good friendships in the church. Um, so, you know, you want your closest friends to be the people in this room. But oftentimes when you spend a lot of time with each other, you know, you, there can be... There can be conflict. So you, you want to know hey, how to be a good friend uh, and the difference with bad friends as well. Obviously, some of the examples we see in the Bible, hopefully none of you guys do here, but I wanted to sh go through uh, some of the passages and uh, give you some examples of good friends and bad friends. Now, first of all, what, what is a friend? Because generally when we think of a friend, um, we think of them in the positive aspects, you know, people that we're close to, people that care for us and whatnot. But the word friend just means companion, isn't it? It's just somebody that you spend a lot of time with. And the problem is, is that you can have good friends and you can have bad friends. And people that you may consider as good friends may not actually be a good friend in the sense that they don't have a good influence on you. So you need to be very careful with who your close friends are. And ideally, your closest friends should be the people here. And ideally, the people here should be people that should be uh, striving to live for God and striving to do what's right and encouraging you to do what is good and right rather than <laughs> what is sinful. Now, when we think of friends in the Bible, probably the two uh, main examples we think of, one is I think of Abraham. Right? Abraham was called the friend of God. And we can all become friends of God if we put our faith on Jesus Christ. And he was the, you know, the father of our faith. As a, as, uh, and also, he was called the friend of God because of his faith. And this is uh, mentioned here in James 2, where it says, "He was not Abraham our father justified by works when he had offered Isaac his son upon the altar? And we know that in James 2, this is referring to his faith being seen by men. This is why it says here in verse 22, Seest thou, so you see, how faith wrought with his works, and by works was faith made perfect. But we know from Romans 4, God can see a person's faith uh, without their works, and that's why they can be justified by faith alone. And the scripture was fulfilled, which saith, Abraham believed God, and it was imputed unto him for righteousness, and he was called the friend of God. So isn't that amazing that if we believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, we can be a companion with God, and we can sing that song. And I believe I've got that at the end. You know, what a friend we have in Jesus, you know, because we have him dwelling with us. Um, he is our companion, just like um, Abraham was called the friend of God. Now, I sort of went to look for the verse that maybe this was uh, quote, quoted from, and I saw there's a few that refer, there's one in Chronicles as well, where a king is praying and saying, Abraham, um, thy friend. But I believe it's referring to this one in Isaiah 41. It says, but thou Israel, Art my servant, Jacob, whom I have chosen, the seed of Abraham, my friend. So we see Abraham is referred to the, as the friend of God. And when we think of human friendship, probably the, the example, you, hopefully you're thinking of, and there might be other ones you're thinking of, is David and Jonathan. Is that what you say? So David and Jonathan, when you think of uh, two really good friends um, in the Old Testament, David, uh, obviously King David, and Jonathan, who was the son of Saul. And look what it says about them. It says here, And it came to pass, when he had made an end of speaking unto Saul, that the soul of David was knit with the soul, the soul of Jonathan was knit with the soul of David, and Jonathan loved him as his own soul. So this is how close friendship can become, that friends love the soul of the other person as their own soul. Uh, and this phrase is actually used in other parts of the Bible as well. But that's how close their friendship was. And we'll, and we'll talk about their friendship a bit, uh, a bit later on in the sermon. But notice this phrase here, he loved him as his own soul. So you have the good friends that love each other like they love themselves. Kind of like similar with a marriage, right? Like a marriage, you, 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 you cherish your wife's flesh, you know, like you cherish your own flesh. Um, but f when it comes to friendship, it's actually talking about the bond between the, the two souls. But that's why, because friends can bind so closely together, it's very important that you choose your friends wisely, right? because bad friends as well can have a bad influence. But just on this, even though they were such good friends, our friends should never be put above God. Right? So we always honor God even before our friends. But sometimes people 
have such close friends that they honor their friends before they honor God. What's an example? Right? Well, they'll go to like a friend's event or something if their friend has invited them to. It's very important. But then they'll skip out on church. They'll skip out on something important. You know what I mean? They will, rather than them being an encouragement to their friend to get their friend in church, their friend will take them out of church, right? So this is where you can see friendships being a detriment to your friendship with God as opposed to your friendship with God leading your other friendships. And we even see this to the very extreme, right? In Deuteronomy 13, I don't know if you've ever tied these two together, these phrases, but look here. It says, if thy brother, the son of thy mother, or thy son, or thy daughter, or the wife of thy bosom, or thy friend, look at this, which is as thine own soul, entice thee secretly, saying, Let us go and serve other gods which thou hast not known, thou nor thy fathers, namely of the gods of the people which are round about you, nigh unto thee, or far off from thee, from the one end of the earth, even unto the other end of the earth, thou shalt not consent unto him, nor hearken unto him, neither shall thine eye pity him, neither shalt thou spare, neither shalt thou conceal him, what was that saying? It's like you don't have pity, you don't spare them, you don't hide them either. Thou shalt surely kill him. Thine hand shall be first upon him to put him to death, and afterwards the hand of all the people. And thou shalt stone him with stones that he die, because he has sought to thrust thee away from the Lord thy God, which brought thee out of the land of Egypt, from the house of bondage. And all Israel shall hear and fear, and shall do no more any such wickedness, as this is among you. Now, we don't live in a government where this is the case, right? Where we, we are only allowed to worship the one true God. But the point I'm trying to show here is in a society where that is the case, the, the importance of God is so great that it's saying here, it doesn't matter who you know, tries to sway people away to worship a false God, even a, a friend, it says here, which is as thine own soul is not above uh, the Lord God in your life. So like I said, you can have good friends, you can have bad friends. Here's an example of having a, a bad friend, you know, and, and sometimes friendship is not always, you know, just with people, but with, you know, with a concept as well, what it talks about here in James 4. Ye adulterers and adulteresses, know ye not that the friendship of the world is enmity with God. So you see how friendship is not just, you know, the positive aspect like we think of it it's just having a close companion so when you're a close companion with the world and obviously that includes worldly people as well right so it can have a it can have a negative effect on you but in terms of friendship with the world like the lust of the flesh the lust of the eyes and the pride of life if you're a close companion with those things it says here you are at enmity with god whosoever therefore will be a friend of the world is the enemy of God. So you see, when you are close with those things, you're an enemy of God. But unfortunately, some people are very close with those things, like worldly people. You want to try and win them back over and influence them for good, as opposed to letting them and that worldliness affect you and you being at odds with God. Now, <clears throat> people make friends over common interests, don't they? I want to show you this example here in Luke 23 where Pilate and Herod become friends. <laughs> but what do they become friends over? Not something very good. So when Pilate heard of Galilee, he asked whether the man were a Galilean. And as soon as he knew that he belonged unto Herod's jurisdiction, he sent him to Herod, who himself also was at Jerusalem at that time. And when Herod saw Jesus, he was exceeding glad, for he was desirous to see him of a long season, because he had heard many things of him. And he hoped to have seen some miracle done by him. So you remember Pilate is speaking with Jesus. He hears about he's from Galilee. So he sends him over to Herod to be judged. Then he questioned with him in many words, but he answered him nothing. So Herod now, you know, is trying to get, you know, something interesting from Jesus because he heard a lot about him. Now he gets a chance to meet him. But when he meets Jesus, Jesus says nothing to him at all. And the chief priests and scribes stood and vehemently accused him. And Herod with his men of war set him at naught and mocked him and rayed him in a gorgeous robe and sent him again to Pilate. And this is an interesting saying, phrase here. It says here, And the same day Pilate and Herod were made friends together, for before they were at enmity between themselves. 
So isn't it interesting here that Herod and Pilate were once enemies, but yet they find a common foe, right? The Lord Jesus Christ, and they become friends over that. So isn't it sad that sometimes people become friends for the wrong reasons, but you want to be friends for the right reasons. You know, and hopefully in church, you can find people where you have common ground, right? Where you have a common interest, you have a common zeal, so that you can be good friends together, and it will draw you together rather than apart. So like I said, it's very important who your friends are, and you don't want to downplay the importance of who your closest friends are. And remember, it's not that, it's not an acquaintance, like friends are not just acquaintances, just people you know. You say, oh, you know a lot of, it's your companions. When you think about friendship, you, what are your companions? Your companions are the people you spend the most time with, the people you spend talking with and chatting with and spending your time with and hanging out. If, if you want your closest friends to be godly people. But if you say, oh yeah, yeah, I'm friends with people from church. Yeah, yeah, like I'm friendly with them and we get along. But then when you think throughout your life, well, who do you spend time with? Is it your family, your brothers and sisters, is it your friends outside of church, things like that? They're going to be your closest friends. And you have, to, be, you have to, to make sure, hey, whoever your closest friends are, whoever you're spending the most time with, don't spend so much time with people that are a bad influence on you, right? Because they're going to rub off on you. Proverbs 13, verse 20. He that walketh with wise men shall be wise, but a companion of fools shall be wise destroyed. There's a lot in Proverbs and we, that's why we sort of walk through Proverbs 27 as we read through the Bible this morning. Proverbs 22, look at this, make no friendship with an angry man and with a furious man thou shalt not go. Why? Lest thou learn his ways and get a snare to thy soul. So very strong words there in the Bible about being very careful about who you walk with who you're a companion of, who are your closest friends. Right? If you walk with wise men, you shall be, they're going to rub off on you. But if you spend a lot of time with foolish people, then that's going to rub off you as well. Just like angry, anger can. You know, and like anger is not a sin, but some people are overly angry. Sometimes angry without a cause, they're just angry in general. And if you hang out with too much of an angry man, the Bible says, hey, that can be a snare to your soul. It rubs off on you. And a lot of people have experienced that when they listen to too many angry preachers, right? They're angry all the time. You start to find your anger. You get angry with everybody. And that can be a snare to you as well. So you need to be careful who you hang out with, you know, who you spend too much time with, who you're listening to as well, right? 1 Corinthians 15, be not deceived. Evil communications <coughs> corrupt good manners. Now, <clears throat> let's look in the Bible at a couple of examples of bad friends. Bad friends. So some of these you may know as I go through them. You'll be prompted about what the story was about. But we'll look at them uh, very briefly. One is Samson and his companions. Right? Samson and his companions. So if you remember the story of Samson, we're going into too depth. But you remember how he went to you know, that other town, Timnath, and then he got in trouble with the Philistines and he started gambling and then... Uh, and, and God actually used that. He used the sins of Samson to actually cause a conflict between Israel and the Philistines, right? But look what it says here at the end of uh, Judges 14. It says, The men of the city said unto him on the seventh day before the sun went down, What is sweeter than honey and what is stronger than a, than a lion? So if you remember, they're answering now the riddle that he gave them and he sort of gambled with them or he made a bet with them. And he remember his companions, <coughs> which were his friends, what did they do? They were like nagging the, the girl that he was seeing, his wife, right? And said, yeah, you know, to find out the answer from him. She found out the answer and then it ended up making him lose the bet. So that's why he says to them, and he said unto them, if he had not plowed with my heifer. So, you know, that's, that's one way to describe your, his wife. It's not a very good way to describe his wife. He says, he had not found out my riddle. And the Spirit of the Lord came upon him and he went down to Ashkelon and slew 30 men of them and took their spoil and gave change of garments unto them, which expounded the riddle. And his anger was kindled and he went up to his father's house. So Samson went off to, in order to settle the debt of the bet, he went off and killed 30 people, took their spoil and then used that to pay off his debt. But Samson's wife, look at this, look at this passage here. But Samson's wife was given to his companion whom he had used 
as his friend. So here's an example of a bad friend in the Bible, where sometimes people are people's friends, not because they love them as their own soul, but because they get something from it. They get entertainment. You know, so you've got to think, you know, are you, are you a good friend in that sense? You know, when you're friends with people, do you just, are you just friends with them because you get something from them? There's something to benefit from. These are the sort of people you want to stray away from as well. Are there people that are out there that are just your friends when times are good, when times are going well? You know? So here we see a bad example of a friend, uh, bad examples of friends, where not only were, you know, Samson as well was not being a good friend because his companion, he had just used him as his friend. And then what happened? His friends that were his friends end up taking his wife, right? The friend. So, you know, you'd think hey, if it was a good friend, he knew that that lady was his wife. He's not going to then go on and, and marry him. But unfortunately, in the world we live in, you know, thank God it, it doesn't, I don't know if it happens so much amongst your circle of people, but you know, you, you might hear all the time that friends are sleeping with each other's wives and things like that. And it's sort of sometimes a running joke in the world because it happens more often than it should. But it just goes to show that these people aren't really friends with each other. They're just using each other for entertainment and whatnot. And then they say they're friends, they're companions, but they're not good friends. Look what it says here in Proverbs 19. The Bible talks about this concept and we know it's a reality when things are going well, when people are successful, when people are popular, that's when everyone wants to be their friend. You know what I mean? And uh, you see that just in, you'll just see that in life in general. You don't want to be that sort of friend. Proverbs 19.6, many will entreat the favor of a prince and every man is a friend to him that giveth gifts. All the brethren of the poor do hate him. How much more do his friends go far from him? He pursueth them with words, yet they are wanting to him. So this is talking about bad friends, right? Bad friends that are only around when things are going well, where there's something to gain. You know, you win the lotto and then all of a sudden, you know, people come out of the woodworks and whatnot. And then you've got friends all over the place. But are they really your friends? Proverbs 17, a friend loveth at all times and a brother is born for adversity. Right? So this is how a true friend should love at all times, in the good and in the bad, in the thick and, the th and in the thin. And a brother is born for adversity when you go through the hard times. Now what's another example of a bad friend? <clears throat> Second Samuel 13 is the story of Tamar, who was uh, Ab uh, Absalom's sister, who Amnon actually forced to sleep. He raped her, right? And it's such a sad story. I'm not going to go through the whole story, but we'll just get a bit of the intro in 2 Samuel 13. It says, And it came to pass after this that Absalom, the son of David, had a fair sister whose name was Tamar, and Amnon, the son of David, loved her. Now, he, now love doesn't always mean the, the good type of love either, right? So love just means he had a strong desire towards her. And Amnon was so vexed that he fell sick for his sister Tamar, for she was a virgin. And Amnon thought it hard for him to do anything to her. But, but look at this. But Amnon had a friend, uh -oh, whose name was Jonadab, the son of Shimea, David's brother. And Jonadab was a very subtle man. See, this is why you have to be extra careful the sort of people you hang around and the sort of people you make your friends. Because if you hang around the wrong people, he had a friend, Jonadab, we see here in this story, he gave him very bad advice, a very bad idea. And he said unto him, what was his bad idea? So we see here that Amnon has a desire for Absalom's sister, right? Say, oh, I love her so much. His friend, Jonadab, comes along and gives him this idea. He said unto him, why art thou, being the king's son, lean from day to day? Wilt thou not tell me? And Amnon said unto him, I love Tamar, my brother, Absalom's sister. And Jonadab said unto him, Lay thee down on thy bed, and make thyself sick. And when thy father cometh to see thee, say unto him, I pray thee, Let my sister Tamar come, and give me meat, and dress the meat in my sight, that I may see it, and eat it at her head. So what was the bad advice that Jonadab gives to Amnon? He says, Why don't you pretend to be sick? You know, pretend you're sick and then say, oh, you know, I need somebody to take care of me. And then ask David if he will send 
tamer to come take care of you so that they can spend some unofficial alone time. And then we know, when you read the rest of the chapter, fortunately, if you don't know the story, what happens there, he ends up raping Tamar. And then after he rapes Tamar, he doesn't even want to be with her anymore. You know, he exceedingly hates her. And then the sad thing with Tamar is he says, well, now the fact that you're sending me out and not wanting to you know, fulfill the duty now that you've raped me um, is even worse than the initial sin. And then she goes off and cries to, you know, and Absalom takes her in. And this is what actually begins Absalom's uh, grudge against David and, and sort of leads to his downfall because he's so bitter against what Amnon did to his, his sister and David really didn't do much about it. But look at what it says here as you read further down in the chapter. And you see here Jonadab uh, talking about, you know, uh, uh, what, uh, what Absalom has done uh, and why he's angry, right? And then it came to pass while they were in the way that tidings came to David saying, Absalom had slain all the king's sons and there is not one of them left. So Absalom was Tamar's sister and he's angry. He ends up killing Amnon for what he did to Tamar. Then the king arose and tear his garments and lay on the earth and all his servants stood by with their clothes rent. And Jonadab, right? So this is Jonadab. This was the friend of Amnon, the one that gave him that advice. It was his idea, right? The son of Shimea, David's brother, answered and said, Let not my lord suppose that they have slain all the young men, the king's sons, for Amnon only is dead. For by the appointment of Absalom, this hath been determined from the day that he forced his sister Tamar. So you see how there, Jonadab is there with David, ready to just expose the sins of Amnon. But whose idea was it? Whose idea was it to create that situation? It was Jonadab's idea to begin with. And we know he had a sort of nefarious uh, motive because the Bible tells us, hey, he was a bit of a subtle man, like how you, you get guys to go about things. So he, you know, we, we can assume that he knew that was, it was a, not a good situation, that this man had a desire for this woman, and then he sort of gave him the idea, planted the, uh, this idea of how they could be alone together, and then it ends up in rape, and he's there, you know, basically ready to say, oh, hey, this is, this is why this has all happened, because uh, Amnon uh, <coughs> forced Tamar, and you kind of think, what sort of friend is that? Now here is a uh, last example I want to show you of a bad friend, is the friend of Judah. So here in Genesis 38 verse 20, it says here, And Judah sent the kid by the hand of his friend the Adolamite to receive his pledge from the woman's hand, but he found her not. Then he, so this is Judah's friend, asked the men of that place, saying, Where is the harlot that was openly by the wayside? And they said, there was no harlot in this place. And he returned to Judah and said, I cannot find her. And also the men of the place said that there was no harlot in this place. And Judah said, let her take it to her, lest we be shamed. Behold, I sent this kid and thou hast not found her. So what is the situation here? If you remember, Judah goes and visits a town and he ends up sleeping with this prostitute. He doesn't realize the prostitute is actually his daughter-in-law. His daughter-in-law is hiding herself because Judah had promised to provide a husband for his daughter-in-law, but he never did that. So the daughter-in-law ends up tricking Judah, pretending to be a prostitute, ends up making her father-in-law sleep with her. Now she's pregnant with her father-in-law's child. So rather than getting a payment, she gets a pledge, which is his signet and things like this, which, which exposes him later. But what I wanted to point out in this story is this is one thing a bad friend does, right? A bad friend, rather than, you know, encouraging his friend to do right, you know, not sleeping with a harlot, you know, exposing things that he has done wrong. What does his friend do in this instance, the Adolamite? He's actually helping Judah to cover his steps, right? Because rather than Judah having to go in and pay, the, the find the prostitute himself and deliver and get his things back, what does he do? He sends his friend in to do the dirty work. Right? And his friend is willing to do the dirty work for him, to bring the kid in so that Judah is not exposed, Judah is not ashamed. So you can see here, this is not the sort of friend we should be. Right? Sometimes being a friend means you need to have your friend own up to uh, the things that they have done and the wrong things that they have done. 
But notice here in all these examples of these bad friends, it's always, it's, it's always, it always involves some sort of fornication, right? Some sort of, so you see with Samson, it's with, his, it's with his wife, his friend takes his wife. And then we saw <clears throat> when it came to, um, uh, when it came to, oh, what was the other one I had? Um, when it came to the uh, Amnon, right? With Tamar, you know, bad friends leading to the sin in the bedroom as well. And same with here, you know, he had bad friends, he went to a town and then he slept with a prostitute and his friends willing to help him cover his tracks, right? So there's some examples of bad friends in the Bible. Let's look at some examples of good friends. Now let's go back to the story of Jonathan and David. And we see here Jonathan really being a good friend to David because what did he do in this instance? In this instance, he was defending David. He was speaking right of David on behalf of David. He was defending his friend, not out of his own self-interest. Because what, what was Saul saying to Jonathan here to encourage him to turn against his friend? He's saying, hey, as long as David is alive, your kingdom is at risk. Right? Because remember, the kingdom was taken from Saul and given to David. So Jonathan had some self-interest in the sense that if his father stayed in power, he was the son of his father. But yet his friendship and his allegiance to David was so strong, he was willing to put that aside and align up with David. That's one of the good things he did. But we see here in 1 Samuel 20, the sort of friend Jonathan is when he stands up to his father on behalf of David. And it came to pass on the morrow, which was the second day of the month, that David's place was empty. And Saul said unto Jonathan his son, Wherefore cometh not the son of Jesse to me, neither yesterday nor today? Because Saul is trying to kill David. But then David has, has not showed up to eat with, at the king's table. And now this is the second day. And Jonathan answered Saul, David earnestly asked leave of me to go to Bethlehem. And he said, Let me go, I pray thee, for our family hath a sacrifice in the city, and my brother, he hath commanded me to be there. And now, if I have found favour in thine eyes, let me get away, I pray thee, and see my brethren. Therefore he cometh not unto the king's table. So I won't get too much into deception, but deception is one of those grey areas where we can see here that you know, there are people that have deceived people for, for good, right? We think about the midwives, we think about Rahab the harlot, you know, told the spies to go out another way. Um, we see Michael's wife as well, remember when she said, oh, you know, David, he's sleeping upstairs, but he had already gone, and then they stabbed the, the pillows and stuff that they thought was David. And here we see Jonathan actually making up a story here to Saul to say, why wasn't David present? But when you know the story, why wasn't David present is because Jonathan had actually discussed with David prior to say, you know what, you, you, know, you hide out in the field and I'm going to go eat and then he's going to wonder where you are and then I'm going to find out whether my dad is, really is out to kill you. Then Saul's anger was kindled against Jonathan and he said unto him, Thou son of the perverse, rebellious woman, do not I know that thou hast chosen the son of Jesse to thine own confusion and unto the confusion of thy mother's nakedness? For as long as the son of Jesse liveth upon the ground, thou shalt not be established, nor thy kingdom. So you see what I was saying about there, where Saul is trying to use Jonathan's, you know, his own interests, right, to turn against his friend, to do wrong against his friend. Wherefore now send and fetch him unto me, for he shall surely die. And Jonathan, Jonathan answered Saul his father and said unto him, Wherefore shall he be slain? Why should he be slain? That's what he's saying. What hath he done? And Saul cast a javelin at him to smite him, whereby Jonathan knew that it was determined of his father to slay David. So it's quite a sad story as well between Jonathan and David. Do you guys remember that story where he, he told David to wait in the field? And then he said, when you wait in the field, I'm going to go out and pretend to do some archery. You know, and I'm going to have my lad go and collect the arrows. And basically he says, if I fire my arrows and I say, you know, the arrows are between thee and me, then it's safe for David to come back, right? So that's, because the idea was David would be hiding. And how do I get a message to David without people knowing that I'm sending this to David? So he'd get out into the field and he'd shout to the lad, you know, the arrows are between thee and me. So then he, that's like, David, no, hey, it's safe to come out, you know, because he doesn't know where he's hiding. 
but if he shoots the arrows and he says the arrows are beyond the you know go run then the then the, the kid that's picking up his arrows wouldn't know that he's sending a message to David but then that's how Jonathan was going to tell David run but because David was so sad at that news because when he went out to go shoot the arrows after this and he said go and the arrows are beyond me David came out of his hiding place to hug Jonathan one more time and they could say their goodbyes and um, it was quite sad but you know the the Bible uses um, <coughs> terms to talk about that friendship like it was very close and people have have tried to sexualize those words to say that you know Jonathan and and David were homosexuals you know which is completely not true at all but it just goes to show that uh, like uh, the bond of a friendship can be so strong that like the Bible uses these terms like their soul were knit one to another they would you know embrace one another and they would weep over not seeing one another again and some people have experienced that sort of friendship in life not easy to find friends like that look here in John 3 here's an, another example of a good friend I don't know if you've thought about these before John answered and said so this is talking about John the Baptist when he refers to Jesus and this is the time when he says he must increase I must decrease but I want you to, to see the example he gives here in terms of the bride and the, and the friend of the bridegroom so it says John answered and said a man can receive nothing except to be given him from heaven ye yourselves bear me witness that I said I am not the Christ but that I'm sent before him and he hath the bride is the bridegroom but look at this but the friend of the bridegroom which standeth and heareth him rejoiceth greatly because of the bridegroom's voice this my joy therefore is fulfilled he must increase but i must decrease so what are some attributes of good friends well we saw in the last one you know to defend your friend to speak good of your friend to speak up for them when somebody is trying to do harm to them but here as well a good friend is happy to see their friend happy you know we talked about uh you know samson he had used him as a friend you know, rather than you thinking about, hey, how does my friend make me happy? How do they make my life better? You know, he's saying, hey, the good friend of the bridegroom, when he hears that the bridegroom is happy, that makes him happy. So you can see this is how good friends operate. Good friends get happy when they see their friends happy. It's not about how happy their friends make them feel. Now, speaking of brides and weddings and bridegroom, I wanted to show you this verse as well in Song of Solomon, verse 5, because ideally in a marriage as well, marriage, husband and wife ought to be friends too. And we obviously won't read through the whole chapter, but when you get through, through chapter 5, the lady is describing her husband, you know, and saying, oh, you know, talking about his hair and all his attributes and things like that, and, and really doting on her husband. And then it says here in verse 16, his mouth is most sweet, Yea, he is altogether lovely. Look at this. This is my beloved, and this is my friend, O daughters of Israel. So isn't it interesting here that the wife of this man was able to say about her husband, this man is my friend. And we want our wives to be able to say that about us. We want husbands. You want, you know, that husbands to be able to say that about their wives. That you're not just you just don't live together you're not just spouses but you can honestly say this is my friend this is my companion this is somebody that cares about me that enjoys spending time with me and that that's how you want what that's what you want your marriage to get to now the last example of a good friend i want to talk about is the lord jesus christ himself but um one aspect here and obviously when it comes to friendships it's really the topic is very similar to just you know maintaining good relationships right but I'm just pointing out some specifics here of what I see in some of these scriptures that I think is interesting but look here in John 15 Jesus says here verse 13 greater love hath no man than this that a man lay down his life for his friends so this is one way you can show great love for your friends your companions ye are my friends if ye do whatsoever I command you so this is a, obviously a little bit different with Jesus Christ, of course, right? Because we, we are our brethren as opposed to master and, and, and servants. Yeah, my friends, if you do whatsoever I command you. Henceforth, I call you not servants. This is what I want to show you in this passage. Henceforth, I call you not servants, 
For the servant knoweth not what his Lord doeth, but I have called you friends. For all things that I have heard of my Father, I have made known unto you. So what does this tell me? That friends talk with one another. You know, you say, well, I have friends from church, but, you know, sometimes people think, say things like, oh, you know, like, I like the people from church, friends from church, but when something is up in their life, like they have a struggle or they want... They, they don't feel comfortable asking people to pray for them. Now, I'm not saying that you have to necessarily tell everybody that you're not comfortable with to pray for you or tell them your deepest, darkest desires or all these sorts of things. But what that ought to make you reflect on is the, the level of friendship you have with people. You know, like, because if you think about it, when somebody's a friend, you are comfortable to share details with them about yourself. That's why Jesus is saying here, you're not just servants, because you don't, you know, you don't know what, what is happening. But he says here, I have called you friends. For all things that I have heard of my Father, I have made known unto you. So what are good friends? Good friends are people that talk to one another, that share with each other, that share interests with each other. And friends are interested to hear about each other's lives. Um, and they share their struggles as well. So there's a, there's a, there's a deep communication that happens between friends and that's why you ought to be friends you know with your spouse because you ought to be communicating one with another but this is an attribute of being friends is that you're willing to share these things and you are willing also to listen to people share these things with them so it's about talking and communicating so that's sort of the last topic I just want to touch on briefly. And obviously there are a lot of different ways you can make friends, but I wanted to show you a couple of verses in terms of friendships in the Bible. And making friends really comes down to talking with one another. You know, being, being able to let your guard down to share yourself with somebody and risk being hurt in order to make a friend. Right? So... That's one crucial aspect when it comes to making friends, is spending time talking with one another, listening to one another, face to face. Right? Because, you know, you may text people in church and whatnot, but do you spend time with one another? Do you sit with one another? Do you talk face to face and build that relationship? And you know what? When you talk with people and you open up, there's always the risk of offending somebody, right? There's always the risk of being offended. So we need to know that if it requires communication to make good friends, one, one side of the coin is we have to be willing to let our guard down. We have to be willing to tell people what we think, you know, and that sort of thing to, to build that friendship. But on the flip side of that relationship, we need to make sure that we're not so easily offended. Like if somebody shares something that might upset you, or somebody shares something that you may not be comfortable talking about, hey, if you want to be a good friend, you need to learn how to listen. You need to, need to learn how to, you know, understand people. Give them the benefit of the doubt so that if they share something with you that might upset you, then you can talk through those things and have a conversation rather than shut down the conversation. Once you shut down the conversation between people, it's impossible to be friends, right? Because how, how can you be friends when you no longer communicate with one another? Look what the Bible says here about, um, and maybe you've been reading it as I've been talking, but isn't this interesting that when God talks about speaking with Moses, he says here, and the Lord spake unto Moses face to face, look at this, as a man speaketh unto his friend. And I always find that sad, you know, sometimes, you know, you think you're friends with people and then, you know, maybe they get out of your life for whatever reason and then they're not even willing to meet up with you, not even willing to have that face to face chat and just thought like, I thought we were friends. Because that's what friends are willing to do, right? Friends are willing to sit down with one another and chat face to face and deal with things. You know, and that's the sort of friends you want. That's the sort of friend you want to be. As a man speaketh unto his friend, and he turned again into the camp, but his servant Joshua, the son of another young man, departed not out of the tabernacle. Now, not only do we see God doing this, but we see here God speaking through inspiration of the Holy Ghost. Also, the apostle John, as he writes, mentions this same thing. He says, I had many things to write, but I will not with ink and pen write unto thee, but I trust I shall shortly see thee, and we shall speak face to face. Peace be to thee. Our friends salute thee. Greet the friends by name. So like I said, conversation, 
communication, speaking face to face, you know, actually having people over or meeting up and talking. This is how you build friendships. You know, this is why it's important to come to church. Come to church is where you meet one another, but it has to go beyond that. You know what I mean? If church, if you just see each other at church, I mean, what level of conversation do you really have with people on a Sunday? Right? Yeah, you sort of say hello, you catch up, you know, you may talk about a few things. If you know people already quite well, then the conversation gets a bit deep. But it has to go beyond that. So how does it go beyond that? You know, you have people over, you hang out with people, you talk to them outside of church as well. So it's building those relationships, um, you know, and then having that common interest to, to build those friendships. And then you'll be able to be a friend to somebody. And then you, one, when you're friends with somebody, you're going to be able to you know, correct them. You're going to be able to be corrected. So not only is friendships about, you know, what you can do to other, you know, you, what you can say to them, right? It's also keeping you accountable because if you have close friends at church, they will also encourage you to do right as well and encourage you too. So this is where we started in Proverbs 27 when it says here in verse 5, open rebuke is better than secret love. Faithful are the wounds of a friend, but the kisses of an enemy are deceitful. Right, so you've got to be a friend first, right? So, you know, it's faithful are the wounds of a friend. It's not just all wounds are faithful, <laughs> right? Some people think, like, all wounds are faithful. I'll just share it out, you know, just tell you, and you, 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 you take it whether you like. But if you're not really a friend with that person, they're not going to take it that as faithful. So when it comes to, you have to build those relationships first. Like, people always talk about, you know, when you offer people advice or when you correct them, you need to earn the right to be able to do that. Because some people, they just go around correcting people and think, oh, you know, I'm just going to give advice to everybody. And those wounds can just hurt. So, you know, you want people to know that the wounds are faithful wounds. You've got to be a friend first. So faithful are the wounds of a friend, but the kisses of an enemy are deceitful. It's good to think about this one this way as well. Iron sharpeneth iron, so a man sharpeneth the countenance of his friend. And people just think, hey, well, when we discuss things really well, you know, it, you, you, to me, you're only sharpening one another when you're actually friends first. Because sometimes when you, you know, debate and you talk about things and you're not friends, it can actually drive people apart. So I don't know if you've noticed that as well. You just think, oh, yeah, well, hey, well, we should be able to talk about these things in church and things like that. And I agree with you, right? Discuss away. But you need to make sure that you build some relationships first so that when you have that sharp and there's going to be a lot of friction there that that relationship can handle it otherwise you just think hey well we're not really that friend. we don't actually love one another we don't actually care about each other we're not actually like listening to one another and actually have a, a friendship here this friction can actually cause a lot of damage so just keep that in mind you know like iron sharpening iron yes but it sharpens the countenance of his friend all right so just some scattered thoughts there about friendship I just want to end on this one last verse. One last verse, I don't want to leave you. <laughs> Generally, when people hear a sermon about things like this, any sort of practical thing in life, people tend to think, you tend to think of people in your life and think, oh, yeah, you know, they could be a better friend that way. They could be a better friend this way. Yeah, if that person didn't do that to me, then I would like them a bit better and stuff like that. But what I want you to end, end this sermon on is whenever you hear a sermon like this, you need to apply it to yourself first. You know, that's why the Proverbs 18, 24 says, a man that hath friends must show himself friendly. So you want friends, you've got to be friendly. Right? You, have to, you have to do it first. And there is a friend that sticketh closer than a brother. So the last thought I want to leave you on in this sermon is, when you think about good friends, bad friends, how to make friends, it's not so much about how to have friends. If you focus on being friends, a good friend you will have friends right so that's where the focus should be when you think about a sermon like this think about how can you be a better friend how can you love somebody else more how can you listen more? how can you be less offended more how can you open up more and build a relationship be a friend to somebody else and if you are friendly you know you will you will have friends all right let's pray Thank you, Lord, for the reminder this morning to be a good friend. Thank you for the examples in the Bible of being a bad friend. So, Lord, just give us wisdom to make good friends, not bad friends, so that we don't, uh, are not influenced poorly. And help us, Lord, especially be a good friend. Help us to show ourselves friendly 
And Lord, help our focus not to just be on, you know, who is friendly to us and, and, and the focus on how many friends we have. But Lord, help us to focus on how to be a friend to others. And uh, we trust, Lord, that that will result in greater friends anyway. So we thank you, Lord. Thank you for your word. Thank you for being the perfect friend to us, Lord. That even though uh, we often, you know, don't do what you command us, we often treat you poorly. Uh, Lord, you still love us. You're still there listening to us and ready to help us. So we thank you, Lord, for that. Help us. Give us the grace to be the sort of friend that you are to us. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.